This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. So, good morning and welcome back. Um, what I want to do today is actually begin a new chapter in 229, in which um, I'm going to start to talk about unsupervised learning. So, um, brief outline for today is I'm going to just very briefly talk about clustering, let's talk about the K-means algorithm, um, let's talk about the mixture of Gaussian's model and the special case of the EM or expectation maximization algorithm for the mixture of Gaussian's model, um, describe something called Jensen's inequality and then we'll use that to, to derive um, a general form of something called the EM or expectation maximization algorithm which is a very useful algorithm that sort of turns out to be used all over the place in different um, unsupervised machine learning applications. So, you know, the standard cartoons that I used to draw for supervised learning was um, if you're given a data set like this, right, and you use, you know, logistic regression or an SVM or whatever to classify between the positive and negative classes, and we call it the supervised learning because, you know, you're sort of told what the right class label is for every training example. Um, and that was the supervision. In unsupervised learning, we're a slightly different problem. You're given a data set. that maybe just comprises a set of points. You're just given a data set with no labels and no indication of what the, quote, right answer is or what the supervision is. And um, <coughs> it's the job of the algorithm to discover structure in the data. Um, so in this lecture, in the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about a variety of unsupervised learning algorithms that can look at data sets like these and discover various different types of structure in it. Um, in this particular cartoon that I've drawn, you know, one type of structure that you and I can probably see is that this data lives in two different clusters. And so um, the first unsupervised learning algorithm that I'm actually going to talk about will be a clustering algorithm. It will be an algorithm that looks at a data set like this and um, automatically breaks the data set into different smaller clusters. Um, so let's see. When the laptop comes back up, I'll show you an example. Um, so clustering algorithms like these have um, a variety of applications. Um, just to rattle off a few of the better known ones, I guess, in bi biology application, you often cluster different things together. Maybe you have data on genes, you may cluster different genes together in order to examine them and understand the biological function better. Um, another common application of clustering is market research. So imagine you have, a you have a customer database of how your different customers behave. Um, it's a very common practice to apply clustering algorithms to break your database of customers into different market segments so that you can you know, target your products towards different market segments or target your sales pitches specifically to different market segments. Um, some of you do later today. I, I don't want to I don't do this now, but um, if you actually go to a website like news.google.com, um, that's an example of a website that uses <clears throat> a clustering algorithm to um, every day group related news articles together to display to you so that you can see, you know, what are the thousand news articles today on whatever the top story of today, and what are the 500 news articles on all the different websites on the different story of the day. Um, at the very start of the class, I actually talked about image segmentation, which is the example, which is the application of when you might. Um, take a picture and group together different subsets of the picture into coherent pieces of, of, of pixels um, to try to understand what's contained in the picture. So that's a, yet another application of clustering. Um, but the basic idea is, given a data set like this, given a set of points, <clears throat> can you automatically group the data set into, um, into coherent clusters? So let's see. I'm sort of waiting for the laptop to come back so I can show you an example. You know what, let me just, well, what's coming up? Why don't I just start to write out the specific clustering algorithm, and I'll show you the animation later. Um, <coughs> so 
So this is called the k-means clustering algorithm for finding clusters in your data set. Um, the input to your algorithm will be an unlabeled data set, which I write as x1, x2, up to xm. And because we're now talking about unsupervised learning, you see a lot of data sets that look like these, with just the x's and no class labels y. So what a k-means algorithm does is the following. And this will all make a bit more sense when I show you the um, animation on, on my laptop. Um, so we initialize a set of cluster, initialize a set of points called the cluster centroids. Um, mu1 through mu k randomly. And so if your uh, input sort of training data are vectors in Rn, then your cluster centroids, these mu's, will also be um, vectors in Rn. And then you repeat until convergence the following two steps. Um, So the, <coughs> excuse me. the cluster centroids will be your guesses for where the centers of each of the clusters are. And so um, in one of the steps, you, you know, look at each point xi, and you look at which cluster centroid mu j is closest to it. And then you, this step is called assigning your point xi to cluster j. Right? So looking at each point and picking the cluster centroid that's closest to it. And the other step is... You update the cluster centroids to be the mean of all the points that have been assigned to it. Um, so, okay, let me just. Let's see. Actually, can I, could you please bring down the display from the laptop? There we go. Okay, <clears throat> so here's an example of the k-means algorithm. Hopefully, with this animation, uh, this will this will make more sense. This is a uh, the names chopped off. This this particular example I got from uh, uh, Michael Jordan in Berkeley. So these points in green are my uh, data points, and so I'm going to randomly <clears throat> initialize a pair of cluster centroids. Uh, so the Red and the blue crosses denote the positions of mu1 and mu2, say, if I'm going to guess that there are two clusters in this data. So, um, steps to k-means, <coughs> excuse me, steps to k-means algorithm as follows. I'm going to repeatedly go to all of the points in my data set, and I'm going to um, associate each of the green dots with the closer of the two cluster centroids. So, um, visually, I'm going to denote that by you know, painting each of the dots, either blue or red, depending on which is the closer cluster centroid. Okay, so all the points closer to the blue cross are pointing 
are painted blue and so on. Um, the other step is updating the cluster centroids. And so I'm going to repeatedly look at all the points that are painted blue and um, compute the average of all of the blue dots. And I'll simply compute, look at all the red dots and compute the average of all the red dots. And then I'll move the cluster centroids as follows to the average of the respective locations. So this is now after one iteration of k-means I'm here. And now repeat the same process. I look at all the points and assign all the points closer to the blue cross to be you know, the color blue and, and similarly red. And so now I have that assignment of points to the cluster centroids. And um, finally, I'll again compute the average of all the blue points and compute the average of all the red points and update the cluster centroids again as follows. And um, now k-means has actually converged. If you keep running you know, these two steps of k-means over and over, the cluster centroids and the assignments of the points to the cluster centroids will actually remain the same. Yeah. Yeah, I'll answer that in a second. So, yeah. yes. Okay. So, um, just can I switch back to draw port, please? So actually, why don't you just take a, take a second to look at this again and make sure you understand how this maps onto, um, uh, how, the, how, the, um, equa how the algorithm I wrote how it maps onto the animation you just saw. Is there a question? I see, okay, uh, let, me all, let me also answer that in a second. Right. Okay, so these are the two steps. This step 2.1 was assigning the points to the closest centroid, and 2.2 .2 was shifting the cluster centroids to be the mean of all the points assigned to that cluster centroid. Right. Um, okay, so briefly, the answer to the two questions I just had. One is, does the algorithm converge? Um, the answer is yes, k means is guaranteed to converge in a certain sense. <coughs> in particular, if you define um, if you define the distortion function to be j of c comma mu um, squared, excuse me. If you define the distortion function to be a function of the cluster assignments and the cluster centroids, and this is the sum of squared distances between the points and the cluster centroid that they're assigned to, then um, you can show, I won't really prove this here, but um, you can show that k means is coordinate ascent on the function j. Um, in particular, I hope you remember we talked about coordinate ascent as an optimization algorithm, like I don't know, maybe about two weeks ago. Um, so coordinate ascent is the algorithm that will repeatedly hold c fix and optimize with respect to mu, or hold mu fix and optimize with respect to c. Right? So that's coordinate ascent. And so what you can prove is, and you go home and prove this yourself, um, is that k-means, the two iterative steps of k-means are exactly optimizing this function with respect to c and with respect to mu alternately. And therefore, um, uh, this function j of c comma mu must be decreasing monotonically on every iteration. And so the sense that in which k-means converges is that this function j of c comma mu can only go down, and therefore uh, this function will actually eventually converge in the sense that it will not, it will stop going down. Okay? Um, it's actually possible that there may be, you know, several clusterings that give the same value of j of c comma mu, and so k-means may actually switch back and forth between different clusterings if they, if in the, in the sort of really in the extremely unlikely case that there are multiple clusterings that give exactly the same value for this objective function, k-means may oscillate between them. In practice, that just about never happens. Um, but, 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 but even if that happens, you know, this function j of c common mu will converge. Um, the other question is, yes, how do you choose the number of clusters? So it turns out that um, I think in, in the vast majority of time when people apply k-means, you, you sort of just manually pick a number of clusters, or you manually try a few different numbers of clusters and um, um, uh, you know, pick the one that seems to work best. Um, 
The number of clusters in this algorithm is sort of just one parameter, so usually I think it's not very hard to choose automatically. Um, there are some automatic ways of choosing the number of clusters, but, but I, I, I'm, sort of, I'm not going to talk about them. When, when, when I do this, I usually just pick the number of clusters manually. And the reason is, um, I think <coughs> for many clustering problems, the quote, true number of clusters is actually ambiguous. So for example, if you have a data set that looks like this, You know, some of you may see four clusters, right? And some of you may see two clusters. And so the right answer for the actual number of clusters is sort of ambiguous. Um, so, I, yeah. Yeah. What if uh, you were to initialize your clusters in a way so that one of the clusters is far away from the data point? Couldn't your, couldn't your algorithm convert to clustering all the points in the same cluster? Um, I see, right. So, yes, k-means is susceptible to local optima. So, the coordinates, so um, this function, jfc, comma, mu, is a highly non-convex, this is not a convex function. And so, um, k-means, so sort of coordinate ascent on the non-convex function is not guaranteed to converge to the global minimum. So, k-means is susceptible to, um, uh, what well, is susceptible to local optima. And, um, if you're an application in which you're work, you, you think k-means might be running to local optima, one thing you can do is try multiple random initializations and then run clustering a bunch of times and then and pick the solution that ended up with the lowest value for the distortion function. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, there are sort of... Uh, Let's see, right, so what if one cluster centroid has no points assigned to it? Then one thing you could do is just eliminate it, exactly as I was saying. Another thing you can do is um, uh, just reinitialize it randomly if you really want k clusters. Right. Well, a lot of questions, yeah. So, norm as a norm, or like, can you type also the one norm, or the infinity norm, or? I see, right, is it usual, is it usual to take two norms? So, um, let's see. For the vast majority of applications I've seen for k-means, you do take two norm when you have data in Rn. Um, I'm sure there are others who have taken infinity norm and one norm as well. I, I, I personally haven't seen that very often, but you can also, yeah, there, 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 are other, yeah, there, there, there are other variations on this algorithm that use different norms, but this is what I'm, what I'm describing is probably the most commonly used variance. Okay. So, that was um, k-means clustering. Um, <coughs> what I want to do next, and um, this will take longer to describe, is actually talk about a closely related problem. Um, in particular, what I want to do is talk about density estimation. So, um, as a motivating example, this is a problem that I know some guys have worked on. Um, let's say you have aircraft engine rolling off an assembly line. So you, you know, let's say you work for an aircraft company, you're building aircraft engines, and they roll off the assembly line. And um, as the aircraft engines roll off the assembly line, you test these aircraft engines and measure various different properties of it. And you know, to use a simplified example, I'm going to write these properties as heat and vibrations, right? In reality, you measure different vibrations at different frequencies and so on, but just write you know, the amount of heat produced and vibrations reduced. Um, let's say that um, you get this data, so if you have a data set like this, you can run a clustering algorithm and characterize this as two clusters, but maybe you get a data set that I don't know, that maybe looks like that. And what you would like to do is estimate the density of these properties, of the, of the, of the joint distribution of the amount of heat produced and the amount of vibrations, um, because you would like to, say, detect outliers, so that as a new aircraft engine rolls off the assembly line, you can then measure you know, the same heat and vibration properties. You can ask, if you get a point there, you can then ask, how likely is it 
that there was an undetected flaw in this aircraft engine and it, it needs to undergo, undergo further inspections. And so um, if we look at, you know, look at the typical distribution of features we get, um, can we build a model for P of X? And then if um, P of X is very small for some new aircraft engine, then that will raise a red flag. We'll say there's an anomalous aircraft engine and we should you know, subject it to further inspections before we let someone fly the engine. Okay, so um, this particular store, this particular problem I just described is an instance of what's called anomaly detection, and so a common way of doing anomaly detection is to take your training set, um, again just your unlabeled examples, x1 through xm, and from this data set, build a model p of x of the density of um, the data, of, of, so the typical data you're seeing. And if you ever then see an example with very low probability on the P of X, then you may flag that as an anomalous example. Okay. Um, so anomaly detection is also used in you know, security applications. You know, figure out if something's doing something unusual at a physical plant or in your computer system. Um, is used for detecting fraud in transactions. If if you know, if my if, if someone start if my credit card. If, if many very unusual transactions start to appear on my credit card, there's a sign that maybe someone's stolen my credit card. Um, and what I want to do now is talk about a specific algorithm for density estimation. Um, and in particular, one that works for data sets like these two, that, you know, this distribution, this distribution like that, right, let's get rid of that. Distribution like this doesn't really fall into any of the standard textbook distributions. This is not really like a Gaussian or a Poisson or an exponential or anything. So, uh, can we come up with a model to estimate densities that may look like these somewhat unusual shapes? So, um, <coughs> to describe the algorithm a bit more, I'm actually going to use a one-dimensional example rather than a 2D example. Um, and the, and in the example I'm going to describe, I'm going to say that I'm going to imagine that um, Maybe a data set that looks like this, where the horizontal axis here is the x-axis, and you know, these dots represent the, the, the positions of the data set that I have. Okay? So this data set looks like it's maybe coming from a density that looks like that, um, as if this were the sum of two Gaussian distributions. And so the specific model I'm going to describe next is a, will, will be what's called a mixture of Gaussians model. Um, and just to be clear, the picture I have is that we're envisioning that there were two separate Gaussians that generated well, that maybe there were two separate Gaussians that generated this data set. And if only I knew what the two Gaussians were, then I could fit a Gaussian to my crosses, fit a Gaussian to the O's, and then you know sum them up. Right, to get the overall density for the two. But um, the problem is I don't actually have access to these labels. I don't actually know which of the two Gaussians each of my data points came from. And so um, what I'd like to do is to come up with an algorithm to fit this mixture of Gaussians model, um, even when I don't know which of the two Gaussians each of my data points came from. Okay. I have no idea what this is. Let me just get rid of it. Okay, so here's the idea. <coughs> In this model, I'm going to imagine um, well, there's a latent random variable um, and latent just is, is just synonymous with hidden or unobserved. Okay, so I'm going to imagine that there's a um, latent random variable z and um, xi comma zi have a joint distribution. Z 
that is given as follows. Um, we have that p of x i comma z i well, by the uh, chain rule of probability. This is always like that. Right? This is always true. And moreover, I'll assume that p of z i is given by the following. z i is distributed multinomial um, with parameters phi. Um, In the special case where I have just a mixture of two Gaussians, then zi will be Bernoulli. Um, and so, you know, and these parameters phi are the parameters of a multinomial distribution. And um, the distribution of xi conditioned on zi being equal to j, so, so p of xi given that zi is equal to j, that's going to be a Gaussian distribution with mean mu j and covariance sigma j. Okay. Um, so this should actually look extremely familiar to you. What I've written down are pretty much, these are all, not, not quite, but almost the same equations as I wrote down for the Gaussian discriminant analysis algorithm that we saw way back, right? Except that the difference is, um, instead of, I guess, uh, supervised learning where, where we were given the class labels y, I've now replaced y in Gaussian discriminant analysis with these latent random variables, or these unobserved random variables z, and we don't actually know what the values of z are. Okay? So, <coughs> um, so just to make the link to Gaussian discriminant analysis even, even a little more explicit, right? Um, if we knew what the z's were, um, which, which we actually don't, but you know, suppose for the sake of argument that we actually knew which of, say, the two Gaussians each of our data points came from, then um, you can use maximum likelihood estimation Right, you can write down the likelihood or the log likelihood of the parameters, which would be that. And um, you can then use maximum likelihood estimation, you know, and you get exactly the same formulas as in Gaussian discriminant analysis. So if you knew the values for z, you can write down the log likelihood um, and do maximum likelihood this way. And you can then estimate all the parameters of your model. Um, does this make sense? Raise your hand if this makes sense. Yeah, okay, cool. Some of you, did, some of you have questions? Some of you didn't raise your hand. Yeah. So each zi is it's just a label, like an x or an o. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Were there other questions? Okay. Well, so, hmm. right. So if you knew the class label, if, if, if you knew the values of z's, so z playing a similar role to the class labels in Gaussian discriminant analysis, then you could use, ma then you could use maximum likelihood estimation of the parameters. Um, but in reality, we don't actually know the values of the z's. All we're given is this unlabeled data set. And so let me write down a specific bootstrap procedure in which the idea is that um, we're going to use our model to try to guess what the values of z is. So we don't know the values of z, but we'll, we'll just take a guess at the values of z. And um, we'll then use you know, so the values of z that we guess to fit the parameters of the rest of the model. 
and then we'll actually iterate. And now that we have a slightly better estimate for the parameters of the rest of the model, we'll then take another guess for what the values of Z are, and then we'll sort of use something like the maximum likelihood estimation formulas to fit an even better uh, setting of the parameters for the model. So, <clears throat> So the algorithm I'm going to write down is um, called the EM algorithm. And it proceeds as follows. Um, repeats onto convergence. In the E set, we're going to guess the values of the unknown ZIs, and in particular, I'm going to set WIJ Okay, so I'm going to compute the probability that ZI is equal to J. So I'm going to use the rest of the parameters of my model and I'm going to compute the probability that um, point xi came from Gaussian number j. Um, and just to be con sort of concrete about what I mean by this, this means that I'm going to compute p of xi This step is um, sort of by Bayes' rule, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and, and again, just to be completely concrete about what I mean by this, the numerator p of x i given z i equals j, you know, well, that's the Gaussian density, right? That's 1 over e to the Right, that's p of x i given z i equals j times p of z i equals j. Um, that is just equal to phi j, and then divide it by, you know, sum from l equals one to k of so the same thing of 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 you know essentially the same thing but with j replaced by l. Okay, so you plug in the formula for the Gaussian in the numerator, and just sum over similar terms in the denominator. Excuse me, this is a sum from, well, sum from L equals 1 through K in the denominator. Um, okay. Let's take a So that was the first half of the algorithm. Um, the other step is the M step, um, the maximization step, where you would then update your estimates of the parameters. So I'll just write down the formulas here. Um, when you see these, you should compare them to um, the formulas we had for maximum likelihood estimation.
like so. And um, <clears throat> so um, these two formulas on top are very similar to what you saw for Gaussian discrete analysis, except that now um, we have these soft weights. So Wij is, you remember, was the probability we computed that point i came from you know, Gaussian, also quote, I don't want to call it cluster j, but let's call it point, probably that point i came from Gaussian j, um, rather than an indicator for where the point i came from Gaussian j. And um, the one slight difference between this and one, one, one other sort of difference between this and the formulas we have for Gaussian discrete analysis is that in the mixture of Gaussians, we often, we more commonly use different covariance matrices for the different Gaussians. So in Gaussian discrete analysis, so sort of by convention, you usually model all, all of the classes of the same covariance matrix sigma. Um, when you're fitting mixtures of Gaussians models, is is sort of, uh, not always, but sometimes you allow the covariance matrix for your different Gaussians to vary. And so, represented on the formulation, we have a different covariance matrix sigma j for every Gaussian, and that's the corresponding way of estimating it. Okay? So, I just wrote down a lot of equations. Let me just take a second to look at this and make sure it all makes sense. Questions about this? Okay. Can you raise your hand if this makes intuitive sense. Why this seems reasonable by analogy to GDA? Yeah. Okay. Oh, only some of you. Um. Let's see. <clears throat> so let's try to explain that a little bit more. Um. So we recall in Gaussian discriminant analysis. Right. If we knew, if well, or rather, if we knew the values for the zi's. So, um, let's see. Suppose I was to give you a labeled data set. Suppose I was to tell you the values of the zi's for each example. Then I'd be giving you a data set <coughs> that looks like this. Right. right. So here's my 1D data set. That's sort of a typical 1D Gaussian discriminant analysis problem. And so um, for Gaussian discrete analysis, we figured out the maximum likelihood estimation, the maximum likelihood estimate for the parameters of GDA. And um, you know, one of the estimates for the parameters for GDA was um, phi j, which is the probability <coughs> right, that um, I guess zi equals j. <coughs> you, know, you would estimate that as sum over i equals sum over i from 1 to m indicator zi equals j divide by m. Okay? Um, when, we, when, we have, when we're deriving GDA, we wrote y instead of z. Right? But if you knew the class labels for every example in your class, then this was your maximum likelihood estimate for the chance that um, your labels came from the positive class versus the negative class. It's just a fraction of example. You might as well like to estimate for the you know, probability of getting an example from class J is just the fraction of examples in your training set that actually came from class J. So this is a mass likely estimation for Gaussian discriminant analysis. Now, <clears throat> in the mixture of Gaussian's model, in, in the EM problem, we don't actually have these class labels. Right? We just have an unlabeled data set like this. You just have a set of dots. Yes. I'm trying to draw the same data set as I had above, but just with the class labels removed. So now it's as if you only get to observe the xi's, but the zi's are unknown. Right? So the class label is unknown. So in the EM algorithm, we're going to try to take a guess for the values of the zi's. And specifically, um, in the E step, we computed 
you know, Wij was our current best guess for the probability that Zi equals J, given that data point. Okay, so this just means, given my current hypotheses for where the Gaussians are and given everything else, um, can I compute the posterior probability? What is the posterior probability that the point Xi actually came from class J? What, what, what is the probability that this point was a cross versus the O? What's the probability that this point was a cross versus the O and so on? And now in the M step, <coughs> my formula for estimating the, you know, for, for, for trying to estimate my parameters phi J will be given by 1 over M sum from I equals 1 through M sum of Wij. Okay. And so the Wij's here, you know, play the role of um, soft versions, I guess, of, of these indicator functions. So Wij is, right, the probability is my best guess for the probability that point i belongs to um, Gaussian or belongs to class j. And um, so, I'll so I'll estimate my phi j using this formula instead of this one. Okay. And um, similarly, this is my formula for the estimate for mu j. And if you replace the wij's with these indicator functions, you get back to the formula that you had in Gaussian discrete analysis. Okay. Does this make somewhat more sense? Just, I'm trying to just convey an intuitive sense of why this algorithm would sort of make sense. Can you raise your hand if this makes sense now? Cool. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the intuition of the EM algorithm. Um, it turns out that the way I came up with these formulas is actually via a slightly more general principle, via, via a more general version of the EM algorithm, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So, sort of, I hope, so, so, so I guess hopefully these equations make intuitive sense, but exactly where they came from is an answer, is a question I'll sort of answer a little bit later. Okay. So, So what I want to do now is actually um, present a broader view of the EM algorithm. Um, what you just saw was a special case of the EM algorithm for specifically the mixture of Gaussians model. Um, in the remaining half hour I have today, I'm going to describe a general view of the, more, uh, uh, sort of the, uh, what, the general description of the EM algorithm. And everything you just saw will be derived sort of as a special case of this more general view that I'll present now. Um, and as a precursor to actually presenting this, to, to deriving this more general view of the EM algorithm, um, I'm going to have to describe something called Jensen's inequality, which we use in the derivation. Um, so here's Jensen's inequality, which is let f be a convex function. Um, so a function is convex of a second derivative, which I've written f double prime, or f prime prime is greater than zero. Right. Functions don't, don't have to be differentiable to be convex, but if it have, has a second derivative, then f prime prime should be greater than zero. Um, and let x be a random variable. Then, um, the f applied to the expectation of x is less than or equal to the expectation of f of x. Okay? Um, and I hope you remember, right, often I'll drop the square brackets. So f of e of x is, you know, this is the same as f of the expected value of x. But when I'm writing expectations, I'll often drop the square brackets. Um, so let me draw a picture that will explain this. And I think so many, many, many of my friends and I often you know, don't remember, so is this less than or greater than or whatever? And, and the way to remember this is, is the way many of us remember the sign 
um, of that inequality is by drawing exactly the following picture. So, right, here's a function. Here's a function f of x. And um, Um, for this example, let's say x is equal to 1 with probability 1 half, and x is equal to 6 with probability 1 half. Okay, so this is a, just to illustrate this inequality with an example. Um, so, <clears throat> let's see. So x is 1 with probability 1 half, and x is 6 with probably 1 half. And so the expected value of x is 3.5, right? It'll be in the middle here. So that's the expected value of x, right? The, the, the horizontal axis here is the x-axis. And so um, f of the expected value of x, you can read off as this point here. So this is f of the expected value of x. Whereas in contrast, let's see. If x is equal to 1, then, well, you know, here's f of 1. And if x is equal to 6, then here's f of 6. And the expected value of f of x, it turns out, is now averaging on the vertical axis, right? With 50% chance, um, with 50% chance, um, you get f of 1. With 50% chance, you get f of 6. And so the expected value of f of x is the average of f of 1 and f of 6, which is going to be you know, the value in the middle here. And so in this example, you see that you know, the expected value of f of x is greater than or equal to f of the expected value of x. Okay? And um, so then an illustration of why Jensen's inequality holds in this case. Um, Um, and it turns out that um, further, if um, f double prime of x exists and is strictly greater than zero, um, if this happens, we say f is strictly convex. Then the inequality holds of equality, or in other words, e of f of x equals f of e x, you know, if and only if x is a constant, right, with probability 1. Well, I guess I should write, well, another way of writing this is x equals e x. So in other words, if f is a strictly convex function, then the only way for this inequality to hold with equality is if the random variable x you know, always takes on the same value. If x is equal to its expected value, we're probably one is, the, is, is one way of stating it. Um, further, um, so I've stated everything for convex functions. Um, turns out that if f double prime is less than or equal to zero, so if f is concave, say, um, <coughs> then everything holds but with the direction of the inequality reverse. So f of e x is greater than or equal to e of f of x, etc. Okay, so just if you have a concave function, then um, all the inequalities hold the same way, but just with the direction of the inequality of reverse. Um, 
And it turns out later on when we derive the EM algorithm, we'll actually use the concave version with, with, this, with this inequality reversed. Um, okay, the questions about this? Oh, uh, say that again? Uh, what is the strictly convex? Oh, uh, I said, couldn't hear that. What, what is what? Oh, uh, what is the strictly convex? I mean, oh, um, oh, I see. If f double prime of x is strictly greater than zero, that's my definition for strictly convex. Um, if, <clears throat> if the second derivative of x is strictly greater than zero, that's what it means for f to be strictly convex. I see, sure. So, um, for example, um, this is an example of a convex function that's not strictly convex because there's part of this function is a straight line, and so um, f double prime will be zero in this portion. So, um, a, so for example, a quadratic function would be strictly convex. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, it just a less formal way of saying strictly convex just means that you can't have a convex function within a straight line portion and then another straight line. It's speaking very informally, and think of this as meaning that there aren't any straight line portions. Um, okay. okay. So here's the derivation for um, you know, the general version of EM. Um, the problem we face is as follows. We have some model We have some model for the joint distribution of x and z, um, but we observe only x. And our goal is to um, maximize um, the log likelihood of the parameters of a model right so <clears throat> um, we have some model for the joint distribution for x and z and our goal is to find the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters theta where um, the likelihood is defined as you know sum from y equals 1 to m log of right, the probability of our data as usual um, and p of x parameterized by theta is now given by um, a sum over all the values of zi, right, p of xi, zi, <coughs> parameterized by theta. Okay, so this is by, is by taking our model of the joint distribution of x and z and marginalizing out zi that we get p of xi parameterized by theta. And so, um, the EM algorithm will be a way of performing this maximum likelihood estimation problem, okay? which is complicated by the fact that we have these ZIs in our model that are unobserved. Um, so, Before I actually do the math, um, here's a useful picture to keep in mind. So the horizontal axis in this cartoon is the theta axis, and there's some function, you know, the log likelihood of theta that we're trying to maximize. Okay. And um, <clears throat> usually maximizing L of theta, you know, by taking derivatives and saying the zero, that would be very hard to do. 
what the EM algorithm will do is the following. Um, let's say you initialize at some value of theta zero. What the EM algorithm will end up doing is it will construct a lower bound for this log likelihood function. And this lower bound will be tight. In other words, it will hold of equality um, at your current guess of the parameters. And we'll then maximize this lower bound with respect to theta. So we'll end up with, say, that value. So that will be theta 1. Okay. And then EM algorithm will look at theta 1, and they'll then construct a new lower bound um, on L of theta. And it'll maximize that. Let's say you jump here. So that's your next theta 2. And we'll do that again to get to theta 3 and so on, until you converge to, to a local optimum on the log likelihood function. Okay? So this is a cartoon that you know, describes what the EM algorithm will do. So let's actually make that formal now. So we want to maximize with respect to theta sum over i log well, that's my theta. Um, so this is sum over i log sum over all values of z So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is um, multiply and divide by the same thing. I'm going to write this as Q. OK. So um, I'm going to construct a probability distribution, QI. They'll be over these latent random variables zi, and so you know these qi's would be a distribution. So right, the, each of the qi's would be greater than zero, and sum over all the values of zi of qi will be one. So these q's will be a probability distribution that I get to construct. Okay, and I'll and I'll later go and uh, I'll, I'll I'll later describe my the specific choice of this distribution qi that I'll make. Um, So now, you know, this QI is a probability distribution over the random variable ZI. So this inner summation is sort of sum over ZI of the probability of ZI times some function of ZI. And so this inner summation is really an expectation, well, is really the expected value of that, of this thing inside. where the expectation is with respect to the distribution of the random variable zi drawn from the distribution qi. Right? So, if, so if <clears throat> you think, what does it mean to take the expected value of this formula with respect to zi drawn from the distribution qi? Well, it's just sum over all the values of zi of the probability of zi times that function of zi. Right? I'm seeing some frowning. I'm seeing some frowns. Do you have questions about this? Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, right, this is the, um, so the log function looks like that, and there's a concave function. So that tells us that the log of e, z, e of x is greater than or equal to 
the expected value of log x by sort of the, you know, the concave function form of Jensen's inequality. And so, continuing from the previous expression, um, we have, um, what's this, right? Log of an expectation, well, this is sum of i of log of an expectation, that must therefore be greater than or equal to the expected value of the log of that. Um, okay, using Jensen's inequality. And lastly, just to expand out this formula again, this is equal to This is equal to that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how I got from this step to this step? Yeah. Okay. So how did this get? Um. Let's see. So. Well. Um. Here's well. Let's say, let's say I have some random variable z, right? And you know, z has some distribution written by, denoted p. Right? And let's say I have some function g of z, okay? Then by definition, the expectation, the expected value of g of z, right? By definition, that's equal to sum over all the values of z, the probability of that value of z times g of z, right? That's, that's sort of the definition of an expe expectation of a random variable. And so <coughs> the way I got from this step to this step is by using that. Um, so in particular, now um, I've, I'm, I'm, I've been using the distribution qi to denote the distribution of z. So this is like sum over z of p of z times g of z, right? So this thing is you know, this thing plays a role of p of z, and this thing here plays a role of g of z in that, in what I wrote above, right? And so um, this is just, you know, the expected value with respect to a random variable z drawn from the distribution q of g of z. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Other questions? So, so in general, when you're doing um, maximum likelihood estimation, mm -hmm. you choose the probability of, or the likelihood of the data. Um, but in this case, you only say probability of x because you only have observed x, whereas um, previously we say probability of x given the labels. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly, right. So, right, not only in maximum likelihood estimation, uh, we want to choose the parameters that maximize the probability of the data. So, right, and in this case, our data comprises only the x's, so because we don't observe the z's. And therefore, um, you know, the log likelihood of our data, excuse me, the, the log likelihood of parameters is given by the probability of the data, which is log p of x i. Right. OK. Um, <coughs> so notice what we've done, right? We've, um, we wanted to maximize the log likelihood of theta and what we've done is, through these manipulations, we've now constructed a lower bound on the log likelihood of theta. Okay. And in particular, this formula that we came up with, we should think of this as a function, if, if you think of this formula as a function for theta, then you know, theta are the parameters of your model, right? If you think of this as a function of your parameters theta, what we've just shown is that the log likelihood of your parameters theta is um, lower bounded by this thing. OK. 
Okay, so we've just um, remember that cartoon of repeatedly constructing a lower bound and optimizing a lower bound. So what we've just done is construct a lower bound for the log likelihood for theta. Now, the last piece we want for this lower bound is um, we actually want this inequality to hold with equality for the current value for theta. Right? So just referring back to the previous cartoon, um, you know, if this was the log likelihood for theta, we then construct some lower bound of it, there's some function of theta, and if, you know, and if this is my current value for theta, then I want my lower bound to be tight, or my, I want my lower bound to be equal to the log likelihood of theta, because that's what I need to guarantee that when I optimize my lower bound, then I'll actually do even better on the true objective function. Um, <clears throat> And so to do that, to ensure that this inequality actually holds true of equality, what I need is, going back through the derivation, what I need is, in the step that I use Jensen's inequality, right, I need this inequality to hold with equality. And in particular, I'm going to choose my distribution. So this bound holds true for any probability distribution Q that I might choose. And so what I'm going to do is I choose my probability distribution Q to ensure that this inequality holds true with equality for my current value for theta. Yeah? How do you know function is concave? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, great question. How do I know that function is concave? Um, yeah, I don't think I've shown it. It actually turns out to be true for all the models we'll work with. Uh, but I don't... Um, do I know that the lower bound is a concave function of theta? I think you're right. In general, this may not be a concave function of theta. For many of the models we work with, this will turn out to be a concave function, but that's not always true. Um, okay, so let me go ahead and now choose the value for Q. And um, if we refer back to Jensen's inequality, we said that this inequality will become an equality if you know, if the random variable inside is a constant, right? If, if you're taking an expectation with respect to a constant valued random variable. So, um, What we want is to choose the distribution QIs so that that is equal to a constant. Um, and by constant, I mean this, is a, this takes on the same value for our values of zi, okay? that no matter what value of zi you plug in, you end up with the same value for this ratio. Um, and so, you would set qi of zi to be proportional to that, right, to ensure that this ratio remains constant. Um, but you also know that these zi's must be um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, this QI must be a probability distribution. And so um, that sum must equal to 1. And um, I don't know, there's a step or two that I might be skipping here, but you can convince yourself that the choice you should choose for this is actually equal to
Um, so the uh, QI of ZI is must sum, must sum to 1, and so you know, to compute it, you can actually just take P of XI, ZI, parent by theta, and just normalize the sum to 1. There is a step that I'm skipping here to show that this is, always, is really the right thing to do. Hopefully, you can just be convinced it's true. Um, for the actual sort of two extra steps I skipped, it's actually written on the lecture notes. Um, <clears throat> but so you then have um, the denominator by definition is that. And so by the definition of conditional probability, Qi of zi is just equal to p of zi given xi <coughs> and parameterized by theta. Okay. And so, To summarize the algorithm, um, the EM algorithm has two steps. In the E step, we set, we choose the distributions QI, so QI of ZI um, will set to be equal to Um, P of zi given xi and parameterized by theta. That's the formula we just worked out. And so <clears throat> by this step, we've now created a lower bound on the log likelihood function that is now tight at the current value of theta. And in the m step, we then optimize that lower bound with respect to our parameters theta, and specifically take the arg max with respect to theta of this. And so that's the, um, that's the EM algorithm. Um, I won't have time to do it today, but <coughs> excuse me. I'll probably show this in the next lecture, but the uh, EM algorithm that I wrote down for the mixtures of Gaussians algorithm is actually a special case of this more general template, where um, the E step and the M step corresponded so pretty much exactly to this E step and this M step that I wrote down. And so, right, just in pictures again, there's my log likelihood function, this function of theta. Um, the E step con constructs this lower bound and makes sure that it is tight to the current value of theta. And that's in my choice of Q. And then the M step optimizes the lower bound with respect to parameters theta. Okay? So um, I have lots more, lot more to say about this in the next lecture. But let's check if there are any questions before we close. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's wrap up for today and we'll continue talking about this in the next lecture.